Do you have the Spirit of God? And those who do are truly sons of God. That just changes everything about you. And you know it perfect, you still will struggle, but now you have the Holy Spirit and it gives you power. And the best thing about this text that I am so grateful for is that God is now your Father. It's not just that your sins are forgiven, it's not just that you aren't going to go to hell. God is actually your Father. You can have an intimate relationship with God. We're no longer God's enemy. We have peace with God through faith in Christ. And that's just an amazing reality. Um, you ever get frustrated with yourself about things? You wish you could do things and then you just like fall or fail or, or, or can't quite pull it off. And, and, and I was particularly reminded of this this last week when I was just uh, looking over some different things, trying to think of a good illustration for the sermon. And I came across this um, this puzzle that is used for sixth graders in Hong Kong, all right? So you, you, you get 20 seconds to solve this, and they're six years old, mind you, all right? So so which parking spot number goes next, all right? So so work on that for 20 seconds, and then honest, you know, honestly here, all right, raise your hand if you think you got it, all right? So 20 seconds, all right, DJ, have you seen this before? Okay, he's on us, all right, guys. Anybody not seen it, they, they, they figured it out. All right, you guys have got showed up by a bunch of six-year-olds, all right? Me too, so don't feel so bad, right? Um, all right, so let me help you out here, because kids are very innocent, and while we're sitting there trying to figure out the mathematical equations, the sequence of numbers, all they did is this. Just flip it over, right? Yeah, 86, 87, 88, 88, 89, 90, 91, all right? And so, yeah, you look at something, and it's so easy and so obvious once you know it, but then, but, but when you didn't see it, when it was it turned around the other way, wow. You know, and that's the way a lot of life is, all right? It, it is. It's, it's like that. You think that this relationship problem or this situation should be easy. I mean, I, I've been around a long time. I've been, I've been doing life for a while, and, and this thing shouldn't be that complex, but, but, but it is. You know, I'm, I, I feel pretty helpless, all right? So just for fun, you can redeem yourself here, all right? All right, show the next one. All right, I got one more I got to use here. All right, you can only use your, this in your head, all right? You cannot use a calculator. You can't write on a piece of paper. In your head, uh, quickly add those together and um, see what you come up with. Anybody who's really confident, uh, let me know what you came up with. 5,000. All right, everybody get 5,000? Oh, you guys are smart, right? Who got 5,000? Oh, some people are scared to death to raise their hand, right? Yeah, I got 5,000, right? Daniel, what's the answer? Yeah, there you go. I was asking the scientist over here, but yeah, 4,100. 4, Who answered that? All right, Michael, good job, good job. All right. And so that one, for sure, I was kicking myself like, oh, how did I do that? I did like three times and got the 5,000 every single time. And so it just brings out that the fact that we are pretty helpless people, right? I mean, we are. We don't know as much as we think we do, and especially when it comes to life and situations and relationships and the frustration we have with the flesh, that we know we need help. We know we need help. And when it comes to our spiritual life and just how we interact in relationships and community with one another. We know we need help. Well, the good thing is that God offers that help through the person of the Holy Spirit that comes and resides in us at salvation. And in fact, in, in Romans chapter 8, just in this chapter alone, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 16 times in this passage of Scripture. 16 times Paul mentions the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit living inside of us should change us. And, and look, we, we talk about this stuff, and we, and we know, we know this stuff, but why is it that we're not changed? So let me just use a real life example for a second, all right? And, and this is kind of equivalent to what we say as Christians. We say, let me, let me just use an example. I say, okay, I encountered God last night, okay? God came to me, and he, and, and he said, I'm going to indwell you. I'm going to come inside and live in you. And I'm going to give you the ability, supernaturally, even though you don't know how to play the piano, I'm going to give you the ability to play the piano, all right? So what are you thinking? You're like, man, if, if God told you that, and God's the one that's like living in you to do that, man, that should be easy, right, to come over here and, and just uh, step behind this keyboard. I, took, I did take one year of piano, to be honest with you. And so fill me now, spirit, and so I'm going to start playing this. And it's not on, so let's turn it on. Here it is. There we go. All right, cool. Not too bad, right? That's a kind of sour note. 
So you get the idea. We, we make these big, bold claims, but the reality is, are we living our lives any differently? I mean, there's dozens and, and dozens of people in this room, and there's thousands and thousands of people around the globe, millions who are churchgoers today, who make this bold claim that the Holy Spirit lives within them and it changes our lives. It changes their life, but the reality is, what do outsiders, what do unbelievers, they look at our life and say, wow, you're making a claim that Jesus actually lives in you, the Holy Spirit lives in you, the person of Christ is in you, and you say that you can you know, live this life that's uh, supernatural and you can follow Jesus and you can live differently and defeat sin, but the unbelievers in our communities or maybe at your workplace look at you and they say, think, you know, either like what you're saying, you're insane because you're not different or, you know, you, you, you're saying the stuff, you know, it just seems so unrealistic. And maybe they even question God, you know, is there, there can't be really a God because he make these claims that this is going to happen, but nothing's happening. And, and so why do we say that? And then nothing changes about our life. Well, Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. And it's really interesting in this passage that that there's nothing that Paul says, here, do this. This is all descriptive of what it's like to know the Spirit, to be in the Spirit, to have the Spirit within us. And so as he describes this, and, and he does this through the whole first part of, of the book of Romans, is he's telling us, here's what the truth is. And then when he gets to ch chapter 12, finally, then he says, hey, now you're going to live this out. Let me show you. You're going to live this out because you know the truth. You're in the truth. You're in God. You're in the Spirit. And so let's look at Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read all the way through verse, from verse 1 to verse 12. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. And those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ." But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but not to the flesh, but to live according to the Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we just pray this morning uh, for Aubrey again. God, we just um, just are reminded of, about the frailty of, of life and how that we all are living, as this passage is going to talk about, in, in bodies that um, need resurrection. God, we, we, we are frail. We are weak. And God, we uh, are, are amazed when we really ponder the thought that your spirit dwells within those who are your children and the potential there to live a life so much bigger than um, the lives that we most of the time uh, live because we fail to, to really, really know you and focus on you and live our life in submission to the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you will just draw us close to yourself today. We thank you that you are resurrecting your children little by little, that, that you are making us more like Jesus, and ultimately as we wait for the resurrection, God, we, we, we long for that day. And God, I pray you'll just teach us uh, today, how that we can uh, be more uh, open to you and to follow you in obedience. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to review just a little bit uh, from last week in case you missed last week or since it's been a week and you've forgotten. But back in Romans 7, Paul showed us that he wrestled with the remaining sin that was, that's in his life. The remaining sin that still resided in his flesh. And in fact, in, in, in verse 15 of chapter 7, he said, I hate the things that I do. I do things that I hate. You ever been there? You do that? You, you do something and you're like, ah, I can't believe that. 
You know, and I was even like, you know, walking with God just a minute ago, and all of a sudden, boom, I did something that I just hate. And we've all been there if we're a believer. We know that. In verse 24, he said, what a wretched man I am. What a wretched man I am. So even though as Christians we struggle with the flesh, the truth is if we've experienced the rebirth, that true believers are going to have a real disgust over their sin and an inability to find lasting pleasure in that sin. You hear that? You're going to find real disgust over your sin, and you're not going to have the ability to find lasting pleasure in that sin. And so, sitting here today in a group of people this size, there's people here that you, you know that you are living in sin. Maybe it's hidden from your spouse, maybe it's hidden from your church family, maybe it's hidden from those who are the closest to you, but you know that you're intentionally choosing to live a life in sin versus being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And it's very clear that in Scripture that we should be disgusted over our own behavior when we fail to live up to what we say, that the Holy Spirit lives within us, we're children of God, but we're not living that way. And there should just be this, this, this um, conflict in our lives over that. But Paul says in verse 22 of chapter 7, he says, For in my inner being I delight in God's law. So the, the, the opposite is true. Disgust over sin for the real believer, the true believer, and a delight in God... For those who really know him, they delight in God. They want their life to, to be for God completely and holy. And I think it's so important to understand this as we launch in again to this chapter because understanding these things will keep us from two, two mistakes. One is legalism, this idea that real Christians don't really struggle with sin anymore. We look at other people and we say, how could they do that? Because we understand if Paul could say what a wretched person I am and I don't do the things I want to do, if Paul could be there... Man, we can be there. And so you need to be careful that you don't have this legalistic attitude and think, wow, Christians shouldn't struggle with sin anymore. I don't get that. But on the flip side, a permissive attitude that says, real Christians are human. They sin like everybody else. And so that's the opposite end, and that's an extreme, and that's wrong as well. This permissive attitude that just says, you know what? It doesn't really matter because it's forgiven anyway, so I'm just going to sin. And so... These realities, the disgust over sin, the fact that we don't find pleasure in sin, it keeps us from those extremes. And so the Spirit of God comes in, and, and it says it transforms, this passage says it transforms our inner being, so we want God, and we want His holiness, but we're at war with ourselves and our flesh, and it's still powerful enough to keep us from doing what we know we should do. And so this conflict, this internal bat battle exists, and it can lead to even greater distress and just the conflict there that exists when we aren't growing and we're not in Christ and we're not focused on Christ the way that we should. I want to take you to a different passage of Scripture just for a second. This is a passage I refer to a lot because, it's, to me, it just wakes you up to the reality of what it means to say, I'm a carnal Christian and I'm okay with that. Because it leaves you in a spot where you can't really, really bank on any of the promises that Romans 8 talks about. Because the truth is, you're in this place where you don't even know where you're at. I want you to look at first, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says that God's divine power has given him everything he needs for a godly life through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So he says, you're fully equipped to live this life of godliness. You've got everything you need at your disposal. And then he begins to go through, and I, because of time, we won't walk through the, the entire passage, but he begins to go through and say, you need to add to your salvation these things. You know, goodness, love, self-control. He's saying, add to these things. Add these things to your life. He says, don't just sit here and say, I've got my salvation, I'm good to go. You know, I'm not going to hell. I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, and, and that's where you just stay, and you live at that spot. Or you grow for a while, and then you get lazy, or you get distracted, or you just lose interest and you just begin to wander off, and you're not growing. Peter says, look at verse 9, he says, Whoever ha does not have them, these things that he talked about, adding to his salvation, all these things, is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So you have a person who is a, a believer, who's a Christian, who has no confidence. They can't claim Romans 8, 1. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ because you know why? They don't have any security of their salvation because they're not pursuing the things of God. And the truth is that the next verse tells us, you know, that we need to work out our salvation. We need to be aware that, you know, we need to see that we can't just coast on some decision that I made, but it's about a relationship with Christ. 
And, and, and it's not about putting your faith in a decision. It's about putting your faith in a person, Jesus Christ. And so, it, what, look, look what he says in these verses. He says, the gospel motivates us. Remembering what Jesus did for you, and Paul's going to talk about this today in, in, the, in chapter 8, being adopted by Jesus, being loved by Jesus, being welcomed to God because of Jesus, that focus keeps us, remembering the gospel, it keeps us motivated to continue to grow. But this obviously, what he's saying here, when we take our eyes off the cross, when we take our eyes off the gospel, and we put them on ourselves or other things, or a checklist of do's and don'ts, or morality, or just going to church, we take our eyes off the gospel and put them on other things. He says, you're nearsighted and you're blind. You forgot who you were and you've been redeemed in the first place, obviously, because you're not, there's no focus on the gospel. And the gospel is how we grow in our faith. The same gospel that brought us to salvation, that gospel allows us to grow. The fact that we are accepted, we're loved. And he's going to talk about this throughout Romans 8 in a few weeks. We're loved by the Father. And, and, that, and, and through our, the gospel and what happened to us, that is our power source to grow as well. So, but you, think about you for a second, all right? Put the spotlight on your life. Is the gospel an important part of your life, your thought life, your action, your, what you do, your habits, your daily routine? Because if it's not, you're losing sight of the cross, you're losing sight of the gospel, and you're going to be in a place where you have no security of your salvation. So i got to move. I could stay there for a while. And so the purpose of this series is to see that we're on the road to freedom. And Mitch said it, the freedom is joyful and satisfying obedience to God. Joyful, get that, joyful and satisfying obedience to God. You see, uh, we're not talking about just obedience to God because you can be the kid who says, sure, I'll do what you told me to, Dad, and you stomp off with an attitude and you do the thing but is there any blessing in that? Is there any really true obedience in that? Is there any delighting in your relationship? And so, Scripture teaches us that it's when we are in Christ and we're growing in our relationship with Christ that we can have delightful and satisfying obedience. And just the, the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That that's what God wants for us on this earth is his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, everything happens the way God says it's going to happen on earth. Even though his sovereignty rules, we still have human decisions and we make and choices we make that God actually, ultimately, we will see it in a few weeks, he can turn those for our good and his glory. But the truth is that a lot of times we just obey out of obligation and duty, and we should be delighting. And so we said last week, we said we need to trust God's promise that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God has nothing against his children. He finds no fault in us. He finds nothing to punish us for. Jesus took the punishment on our behalf, and we're free, and we stand uncondemned before him, justified. God understands that we're going to struggle with sin. He's not angry with you. If you're pursuing Jesus, and he's the object of your faith, you need to quit punishing yourself. Jesus was punished for you. Stop condemning yourself. We also said that we need to trust God's process. The law of the Spirit overcomes the law of sin and death, that God is working on us. God is changing us. Verse 2 of chapter 8, Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So you kind of put these two together, paraphrase it. He says, we know that we are out of condemnation because God sent the Holy Spirit into our life to free us from sin. Let me say that again. We know we are out of condemnation because God sent the Holy Spirit into our life to free us from sin. And in verse 2, it says he set us free. And, and, and we're not talking about just here that the condemnation side is awesome, that, that Christ was punished for our behalf. We won't be punished. But we're going to see today there's also the side that we have power over sin. We don't have to be victims to sin. And so the third thing we're going to talk about on this road to freedom, trust that God has broken the power of sin. Not just the penalty of sin, not just your destination, but he's broken the power of sin practically, realistically in your life. That you can say no to sin. 
The presence and power of the indwelling Holy Spirit liberates us from being victims to our humanity. The power of sin is broken by the Holy Spirit, and we don't have to rely upon our own efforts to accomplish that. We rely upon the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. So what's he talking about here? All right, let's talk about this before we move on to about the Holy Spirit. He says that the law of Moses... You look back in the Old Testament, first five books of the Bible contain the law of Moses. The law of Moses could not justify us. It could not make us right with God. It couldn't sanctify us because why the verse say? Because of the weakness of our flesh, our humanness. The law, good and holy, perfect, but since our flesh is weak and unable to keep the law, it was unable to justify us. It had no power. And so he says, our depravity, our humanness, makes the law powerless to save. So what, look at verse 3, so what the law couldn't do, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So it's not based upon us and our efforts, it's based on what God did, and it's based upon Jesus coming on our behalf. And and, uh, Paul's talked about this in Acts, I want to just kind of read this other passage because it really clarifies what I'm saying here. In Acts chapter 13, Paul's preaching, and he says in verse 38 and 39 of Acts 13, he says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So in verse 3 and 4, it says God did two things. He condemned our sin in Jesus, in his flesh, in Jesus. He did what we couldn't do. We couldn't measure up. So Jesus was condemned on our behalf for our sin. And the second thing it says, he says, we can fulfill the righteous requirements of the law now. Look at at the verse verse, uh, 4. The righteous requirements of the law can be fully met in us. And while I think that's what's called positional, meaning that God looks at us and he sees Jesus, but I think there's also the practical element of that, that the righteous requirements of the law can be met in us now. The Holy Spirit lives in you. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives in me, and we're able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. We can love God. We can love our neighbor as ourselves. We can find joyful obedience in him. We can delight in his laws and his truth because of the Holy Spirit now who makes his laws known to us, not just on a checklist sort of way, but on a way where we find our delight is in the law of the Lord. And the psalm said we meditate in it day and night. It becomes an integral part of who we are. And we can live, verse 4, the second half, we don't live according to the flesh, but we live according to the Spirit. So as we live in accordance with the Spirit, in step with the Spirit, we can fulfill God's law. We can obey Him delightfully and joyfully. And so we move to the next section. I was That was... Supposed to have been finished off last week, all right? So I just finished last week's sermon. So brace yourself, not really. It, it, we, we'll, we'll move quick. Verse, verses 5 through 8, Paul is going to now contrast what the sinful mind is and then the mind controlled by the Spirit. So, so you need to see it as two contrasts. And I'm going to lay this out, not necessarily like the verses go. I'm going to lay it out what the verses say about this mindset that's of the flesh and a mindset of, of the Spirit. So you can see the differences. And again, Paul's words here are descriptive. They're descriptive. He's describing two kinds of life, two kinds of humanity, two ways of living, and there's only two. There's a, one way, verse 9 says, the realm of the flesh, and the other way is the realm of the spirit. Okay, so you're talking about unbelievers and believers here. So being in the realm of the flesh is not possible for a Christian, and being in the realm of the spirit is not possible for an unbeliever. So let's look what Paul says first about those who are of the flesh. Verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. So they live according to the flesh. Living according to the flesh is to prefer, to be inclined to, to enjoy um, uh, uh, things on our terms, not wanting anything to do with God, wanting God out of the picture. I'm going to live my life selfishly the way I want to live it. I don't want to live my life in obedience to God, and I sure don't want to live my life to bring glory to God. And so the flesh is, is hostile to God, it says. It's hostility to God. 
I want to do life on my terms. And it says in this verse, they cannot please God. So these people in the realm of the flesh, they cannot please God. The mindset looks at everything without reference to God. These people could do good deeds. They could be, do good things, but they're not pleasing to God. Come, let me illustrate that. Let's say, for instance, there is a righteous king or a righteous ruler, and there's people over here who are rebels, and they don't like this king, they don't like this ruler, and so they decide to rebel against the king and his kingdom. Okay? So you've got these rebels, a group of rebels over here, and, and these rebels could do good things, right? They could, like, you know, take care of each other. They could um, treat each other with respect. They could get up every morning and iron their uniform and make it look real good and nice and great. But at the end of the day, they're still what? They're still rebels. Everything they do is in rebellion against the king. And so uh, you'll get a lot of pushback from people, a lot of pushback. And you will not like the response you get from people if you ever say to someone that somebody who doesn't know God can't do anything good because they won't get that. They'll say, what? There's all kinds of good done in this world by people who aren't believers, who aren't Christians. Well, you have to remember, keep your mindset on the fact that good is only what brings glory to God. And people who are rebels against God can't bring glory to God. And so these people are unable to please God Verse 6, it says, The mind is go- that's governed by the flesh is death. A person of the flesh is dead to God's spiritual reality. They can't know God's will. They can't know God's purposes. They can't live to please God. Verse 7, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And so let's make sure we don't we get our terminology straight here, okay? The realm of the flesh, in the flesh, unbelievers. Christians, we can still be fleshly in the things that we do. We can still live contrary to God, but we are under no condemnation. But we, as Paul said, we still battle. We're talking about this more in a second. We can still battle because we are still human, living in, living in unredeemed bodies. So let's look at the contrast. Verse 5, the second part of 5, let's look what it says. It says, But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So those who live according to the Spirit, someone who's truly a believer, someone who's in Christ, and Christ is in them, their mind is set on what the Spirit desires. Literally, that means they mind the things of the Spirit. They mind the things of the Spirit. So are you a Christian? Are you a believer? Is your faith truly in God? Are you a child of the King? Then your mind should be about the things of God, should be about the things of the kingdom. You should mind the things of the Spirit. And as we look at this over the next few weeks, you're going to see the the, the stark contrast between a Christian who walks in the Spirit and 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 a Christian who does not walk in the Spirit. But as we sang beautiful songs that Mitch picked out today, really spoke to the words here, that God is working on his children. He's conforming you to his image. And back to the Peter passage, 2 Peter. Look, if you're sitting here and you're looking at your life and you're thinking about your life right now and you don't see any real desire to mind the things of the Spirit, then either you're not a believer or you're in the place that Peter talked about where you don't know. You have no security. I mean, you, you can bank on some decision, but you're not banking on Jesus. Because if you look at Jesus, you see the cross. And you see the gospel. And you see your only hope is him. And as you look at the gospel, and as you see the gospel, and as you see Jesus, it changes your mindset and the way that you live your life. And so he goes to verse 9, and now he's speaking directly to his readers. He says, you, however, talking to Christians, talking to the church, you're not in this realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So you is emphatic. He says, you can please God. Why? Because you're not in the flesh. You're not in the realm of the flesh. The power of the Holy Spirit is available to you to live joyfully, and find satisfying obedience to God. 
And we can act, as I said, in the flesh, but literally we're not, we cannot be in the flesh, all right? And, and so I know that terminology, we, we mess up, we do something and we say, man, I was in the flesh on that. But technically a believer can't be in the flesh. You're no longer in the flesh. You're a brand new entity. You're in the spirit. And yes, we still sin, but when we sin, um, you're, you're going against the direction the Holy Spirit leads you in your life. You're going against that direction. You're fighting against the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. And so, practically speaking, are you fighting the Holy Spirit? Are you, have you been there recently where you just you, you, you know that you're giving way to the fleshly desires? You're being fleshly in your spirit? And you hear the Holy Spirit speaking and saying, it's not right. It's not right. Do you alter your course? Or do you make excuses? Keep going the direction you want to go? And so verse 9 says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he says plain and simply, they don't belong to Christ. And, and I think this is interesting because it seems really logical to us, but if you grew up maybe in a tradition where... Um, there was a second baptism, like you became a Christian and then you became a super Christian once you're baptized in the, in, in the Holy Spirit and you really, that's when you get the Holy Spirit. This verse speaks, I mean, so directly to that. If you don't have the Spirit, you're not a believer. You're not a child of God. You don't belong to Christ. And so I think it's important to understand that. And there's a lot of good people who believe that, you know, I, I get saved and then I get the second baptism and then that's when, you know, I get the Holy Spirit and the power and all that comes from no, if you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. And for sure, we're going to talk about next week, for sure, we can walk in the Spirit, we cannot walk in the Spirit. But the truth is, and you may not realize this, you, you can't get more of the Spirit within you. All right? You don't get more of the Spirit. You know what happens? The Spirit gets more of you. That's what happens. And that's a big, important distinction. That's not just words, you know, and, and parsing out things. That's, that's truth, is that you can't get more of God in you. God needs to get more control over you. And then verse 10, And if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. I have a 15-year-old in my house. I can, I can use this illustration because she's not here. Nothing bad about her, though. But she's 15, and she's got her learner's permit. And she's driving now, and, and so I'm riding with her. Michelle's riding with her, and we're teaching her how to drive. And, and I constantly tell her, I was like, oh, I wish I had, like, the car that I learned to drive on. I wish I had a stick shift. I was telling her yeah, last night, I was like, if you think this is hard to remember stuff, try to drive with a stick shift as you start to drive, because then it's really challenging because you've got to think about the, the, the clutch and the gears and all that stuff on top of all this other stuff that you have to learn. And I, and I was thinking, you know, it'd be nice just to have an old, ratty, stick shift car, junky car, kind of like the one that, that, that I grew up uh, driving on. And I think it's a lot like our, our spiritual life, you know? It, 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 God kind of has put us in this old, cranky, pain-ridden, um, you know, life and body. And, and, you know, the truth is, if we can learn how to handle these bodies, and we can learn how to make them obey, and present them to God as a living sacrifice then we're truly ready to grow in spirit to receive the redeemed bodies that are being prepared for, as Scripture says. And so it's, it's not an excuse to say, oh, you know, I'm so fleshly. Or, you know, I just, I, I'm just a victim. Or, you know, I, I can't help it because, man, there's a long line of family history toward this in my, in my family. And we can play the victim all we want, but if the, if the spirit is in us, he's called us to get control of these cranky old bodies that are broken and falling apart through the power of the Holy Spirit. To, to see that we can use even our bodies that are unredeemed and are broken or dying, we can use them for God's kingdom and his glory. And so saving grace, it doesn't regenerate our unredeemed human flesh. Your body is still dead. You still, your body is under the wages of Adam's sin and your sin. We get sick, we die, because we, we live in unredeemed and unredeemable bodies. But can, they can be controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can take us and use us in ways that are beyond our imagination. But the fleshly nature will always still be in rebellion against you. Get that, hear that. 
I think it's easy for us to look at people who've been believers for a long time, pastors, K-group leaders, elders, and say, man, those people, man, they, they still don't sin. You know, they're just like, seem like above the sin. No, not true at all. While they hopefully have grown a lot over the years, the truth is that fleshly nature is always in rebellion against God. And it will always be your worst enemy because it still needs resurrection. That's why when you get down to verse 18 in a couple of weeks, when Paul's talking about just, he, he says, creation's groaning. And then he says, you know, I, I'm even groaning. He says, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. He's looking for the day where this internal conflict and this battle with himself will be over, that he doesn't have to just live in helpless frustration and say, yeah, if only you know, I, could, I could get this under control completely, if I could like, totally walk in the Spirit all the time. And he's longing for that day. So Paul is saying, Christ is in you. The Spirit of Christ has changed you. Your nature has been changed. You're a new person. You love God. You hate sin. You long to do what pleases God. You want to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, and they can be met in you because of the power of the Holy Spirit, but you're still incarcerated in this body that is dead because of sin. And our flesh, you know, it doesn't gradually get better. Verse 18 of chapter 7, I know that nothing good dwells in me in this flesh, Paul says, so it actually gets worse. Our remaining humanist constantly drags us back into simple ways. And if you don't believe me, Ask the guy who's been, was an alcoholic, and now he's been sober for 40 years, and he says, no, 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 I can't even take one drink. Why? Because it'll drag him right back down into it. Those sins, as you're walking through life, and you think, man, victory, I'm getting victory over those things. And all of a sudden, you have that one moment of just failure and falling on your face, and you're reminded, man, you live in a broken down body. You live in a body that is, is, is rebelling against God, and his ways, and his purposes. But you have the Holy Spirit who provides a real power source, the real energy to be different. Do do you believe that? Do you believe the supernatural empowering gives you the ability to live life in a way that's different than people who aren't believers? I think the greatest tragedy, people who claim to be believers and then go to their work and lie, steal, cheat, Act like, you know, just everyone else, but claim to be a Christian. Their life completely denies Christ. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. But before we gain any victory over sin, we must first accept the fact that our natural self is always in rebellion against God. Write that down. Before you gain victory over sin, you must first accept the fact that your natural self is always in rebellion against God. Always in rebellion. I think it's a humility. As I was, uh, last week as I was given that first grade illustration, if you were here, the illustration uh, from from my school when I was a first grader, it kind of rattled, I guess, my brain, and I I remembered some other stuff about my first grade that I I, I repressed. You know, first grade's hard, you know, I mean, it really was. I mean, elementary school is tough, all right, and I remember a time where I was on the playground, and I don't remember what happened here. But, but I remember that there was like four or five boys that were brothers. And some way we got crossways, and they gathered around me, and they pushed me down on the ground. And I fell down, and I started to get back up. And as soon as I got, st- got back up, the, guy, the next one shut me down. And then I got back up again, and the other one shut me down. And this happened for quite a few times. And finally, I just lay there. You know, I thought I was big and bad and tough, but I just lay there, and I cried. And finally, they just just left me alone. And I think that's what we're getting at here, that the fact is we have to be broken and understand that left to our own strength, left to you, you're going to fall, you're going to fail. Trying to live life in some moral moral code, even by the Bible, by your own power and your own strength without a relationship with God, without the Holy Spirit living through you, you're going to be constantly, constantly feeling like a failure. And that's so a shame because as children of the king, we should be living under this no condemnation attitude. But instead, we feel this being defeated all the time. The Spirit gives us real power. In verse 11, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he will raise Christ from the dead 
he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to this mortal body because of the Spirit who lives in you. So in verse 10, Paul gives the bad news that our body is dead because of sin, but now he counters it with the good news that your body is going to be, you're going to be resurrected one day. You're going to be resurrected one day. Do you feel that tension like Paul does? Do you groan waiting for the redemption? I mean, we look at death for sure as, as like this, this, this horrible thing, and, and it's no fun to realize that it's a result of our sin. But the truth is, death is going to bring about a great day when we're finally, finally free to worship and glorify God. Completely, totally. And I've always thought this, and tell me if this has ever hit your mind. I think, you know, I wish that, you know, I, 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 sometimes I worried, especially when I was younger, like as, about eternity. It's like, I don't really want to glorify God that much now, so why would I want to glorify him for all eternity? I mean, that sounds like a big, long church service or something. You ever had that thought? I would say, if that thought hits your mind right now, and you're like, yeah, I kind of get that, you don't see God for who he is. You don't see him in his glory, and you don't see the truth of the gospel, that you were an outcast, broken under the, under the wrath of God, destined for eternal separation from him. And he saved you not to a heaven where you can go and float around in the clouds and be a little angel. He saved you to take you in his presence. In his presence, that's where heaven resides so you can bring glory to him. And so if you have no desire to glorify God now, why would you desire to glorify God for all eternity? That's a thought-provoking question which will really push us to think about our relationship with God and see, are we on solid ground or not? And now I love verse 12. This is kind of transition to next week. He says, Therefore, in light of all this we've talked about, brothers and sisters, we have, no ob- we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. So he says, look, based on this truth of the Holy Spirit being in you and the power that you have available to you, that you are not under obligation to the flesh, but you have an obligation to the Spirit. You have a debt, in other words. And it's certainly not to live to the flesh, to live for yourself, to live selfishly. Why? Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Get this, this life I live in the body, hands, feet, arms, eyes, I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So we can live this life in these broken down bodies by faith to please God because of the Spirit who lives within us. And so it's not an excuse. You know, some people are scared to death of of talks about grace and about no condemnation because they see it like, whoa, people are just going to go crazy. They're going to live however they want because there's no condemnation. That You know, God's not angry with them. He's, He's fully satisfied because of Jesus. But you don't get the gospel. You don't see the glory of God. That's what we're talking about. You don't see him, and you see eternity as like when you begin to think of it like forever glorifying God, you think of that as a drudgery and a and miserable existence. Because you don't realize that you died when you came to Christ. And this body now is dead. And it's only to be used for God and his glory. And so we'll talk about this more next week. But through grace... Through grace, we can take lots of measures in order to bring these bodies under control. Things like fight club and accountability. We can take things like reading the Bible and and praying diligently. Because we understand, just like Jesus told his disciples when he was preparing to go to the cross and he went back to find Peter, James, and John asleep. And what did he tell them? He said, hey guys, watch and pray so you won't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you need lots of things in your life. You need the church family. You need a a group, a community, a small group, a a K group. You need lots of things in place that through grace, 
now that you bring this broken, rebellious body under control so it can please God, not live for its own glory and live for self. Are you willing to go to whatever extent necessary? Pray about that this week. See, do do you long for God's glory to be the driving force in your life? Or is it just obedience out of duty, out of drudgery? Got to go to church. Got to do that. Got to go to K-group. Got to read my Bible. Got to pray. Or are you delighting, finding joy in obedience? The Spirit empowers us to do that. Let's pray. Father God, Help us to remember that we're not obligated to this flesh anymore. We don't owe this flesh anything because you gave us your spirit. God, help us to choose life. Help us to make choices each day to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow you. God, help us to not be sad about the things in our life that may have to be killed off. Things that we naturally love and Maybe we, we, uh, we find a lot of pleasure in them through the flesh. But we know those things are pulling us away from you, dragging us into living under the dominion of the, of the flesh in a fleshly way. God, I pray that you'll allow us to sever those things, those relationships, those, those circumstances that we fall, find ourselves in, those places we go that constantly drag us back into a fleshly mindset. God, I pray you'll just help us to just continue to depend upon you and your spirit. Help us to be humble and know that we are weak. And when we're weak, you're strong. God, give us the really practical wisdom to walk in the spirit and to fulfill your will, we pray in Jesus' name.